This is Dr. Karen, and this is the Are They 18 Yet podcast, where I help parents raise independent, self-sufficient kids without sacrificing their own identity and sense of purpose. I'm here to share practical day-to-day solutions for raising kind, successful, well-adjusted human beings and actionable advice for supporting systemic changes so we can make this world a more inclusive, accepting place now and for future generations. Hey everybody, it's Dr. Karen, and welcome to episode 43 of the Are They 18 Yet podcast. On this episode, I am going to talk about something that I address a lot with the SLPs that I mentor and something that I did a lot of work with during my doctoral work and when I was working in the school systems as a speech pathologist. And that is the topic of reading comprehension. My area of expertise is language and literacy. So obviously, when you're talking about language, you're thinking about comprehension. And when you're talking about literacy, you're thinking about reading. And being able to understand what you are reading is such an important skill in an academic setting because that is what's required. Once you learn to read in the early grades, you have to be able to read things and understand what you're reading and make sense of it. Whether you are taking a test or whether you are just reading something and getting information. And this continues on into adulthood. So we have to be able to comprehend what we're reading in college, if we go to college, or if we even go to some type of a trade school, and then just throughout our lives, we have to be able to make sense of text, especially now that people are so reliant on things like social media and email and texting. It's a really important thing to be able to do. And yes, we do have certain softwares that will read things to you so that you can listen. It's still a huge asset to be able to read and comprehend effectively. So obviously, if you have a child who is struggling to understand what they're reading, whether it be because they're having a hard time reading one word at a time or whether it is also because they're having a hard time understanding the vocabulary and just making sense of the big picture, that can have an impact on how they do in school. And if they don't comprehend well when they're reading, then that can certainly make school very difficult. So it's something that's really important and an asset to someone as they are going through school and life. That's not to say that if you struggle with reading, you can't be successful, but it certainly makes things a lot easier if this is something that you can do. So I'll start off the episode by talking a little bit about how comprehension and reading instruction typically works within the school systems. And then I'll talk a little bit about everyone's role in the process. So whose job is it to support kids in developing reading comprehension skills? So if you are a therapist, like an SLP, if you are a teacher, or if you are a parent of a child, and you want them to learn to have strong reading comprehension and you want to know how you can support these skills, you will find a lot of value in this episode. Before I get started, I wanted to share something brand new that I just released. I've been working on it over the winter holiday. It's early January as I'm recording this, but I have for the past couple years been sharing a presentation that goes over my overview of the framework that I teach speech pathologists to give a little bit of context. Back when I started practicing as a speech pathologist in the school systems, one of the 
most common things that I treated, it was actually over half of my caseload were students who struggled with language processing. So they would have a hard time following directions in the classroom and knowing how to follow along in class. They had a difficult time sometimes having a conversation and being able to follow the conversation or learn vocabulary concepts that were being taught in the classroom. And then, of course, the topic of the day, reading comprehension and building those literacy skills was often something that was a challenge for those particular students because, again, they didn't process language in a way that allowed them to get information and comprehend those messages, which is really important to being able to function well in a school environment or really, you know, when you think about how things progress after school, this would also affect their ability to form relationships and then also navigate different work environments as well. So skills that are really important, this was a huge part of my caseload, but as a speech pathologist, especially my first couple years, I wasn't exactly sure what my role was in intervening. Part of the reason it was so challenging was because it's a very broad area, and unlike a lot of other things that speech pathologists treat, there isn't one standard protocol for addressing it, and because language is something that really impacts students across the board, and it's, it's something that teachers address as well with some of the things they do in the classroom. And then there's things that parents could do. And so it could get really confusing with regards to what everybody was supposed to be doing, which is kind of the topic of today. Because this was such a challenging area for me, this is actually what I decided to specialize in when I went back and got my doctorate in special education. And during that time, I did a lot of research on vocabulary and literacy to really get to the bottom of who's supposed to be doing what. And specifically for SLPs, I looked at what they could be doing in order to be extremely efficient with the time they have with their students and really support the whole team of people that were supporting the student in building those comprehension and language skills. So I know that the listeners of this show range from teachers to parents to speech pathologists. And so I did want to share this presentation that I have just recently revamped and created a brand new extended and updated version. I wanted to share it here because specifically for my SLP listeners, it will be extremely helpful in getting some clarity around how you can make the most of your language therapy sessions. But for teachers and parents, you're welcome to check it out as well because one of the most powerful ways to understand your role in a certain process is to understand everyone else's role so you can understand how everything fits together. So I am going to give some clarity around that today, but if you wanted to dive deeper, you're welcome to check out this presentation. It's called the Five Component Language Therapy Framework for Boosting Comprehension and Expression, and it is a pre-recorded presentation. There's multiple playing times every day, and there is a little question box that's up during the presentation. So if you're listening and you have a question for me, you can pop a question in the box and I will get back to you. And so to register, all you need to do is go to drkarenspeech.com backslash language, and you'll be able to grab a spot in this free presentation. Again, I walk through my framework that I teach SLPs for building the comprehension and processing skills that they need in order to be successful in school and support skills like reading comprehension. Again, that's drkarenspeech.com backslash language. So now let's talk a little bit about how reading comprehension instruction typically works in the school system and where everyone can play a part in supporting kids. So first, 
and, and this is a lot of people who do work in the schools are aware of this trend, but just in case you don't have an educational background or you want a little bit of a refresher, the general sequence of how it works is that in the early grades, so kindergarten, we're working on those pre-literacy and emergent literacy skills, really the big boom in reading instruction happens in first grade. That's where you see a huge amount of growth in a lot of kids where they typically are actually learning to read. As far as the level and complexity of books that kids are able to read, there is a huge boom in first grade. Obviously, that varies for kids depending on just where they are developmentally and a number of other factors, but there is a big jump in in first grade. And then in second and third grade, kids are really fine-tuning some of those skills that they learn in kindergarten and first grade. So the words that they are expected to read get more complex. So there are words, instead of just basic words with just one syllable, there are words that have multiple syllables. I talked a bit about reading instruction in episodes 27, 28, and 29, but but basically a lot of words that kids are expected to read in those late elementary years are multimorphemic, meaning that they have multiple morphemes. So that's, you know, things like prefixes, suffixes, root words. There's there's more to the words that they're expected to read. So a lot of the words that they're expected to read have multiple morphemes, meaning that they might have a prefix and a suffix on them. And so kids have to pay attention to all of those different parts of words, which means that the vocabulary that they are, of the words that they're reading goes up as well. So yes, kids in the early grades can start to learn and pay attention to some of those skills, but they're really being solidified in second and third grade. And so a lot of the instruction in those later elementary years, since kids have that base, they're able to understand what they're reading. And yes, they're still developing some of those decoding skills, at least the majority of kids uh, in third grade, fourth grade. That's when it shifts more from learning to read to reading to learn. So in other words, the focus becomes more on comprehension. So instead of learning to read individual words and decode, we're now focusing on the message behind what we're reading. And I say this with, when I say what's normal, there's a huge range of what's normal for kids. Some kids take longer to develop those skills and they do require more fine tuning in those late elementary years. Uh, But the instruction tends to shift because then we want kids to be able to take the information that they're reading and learn more information. And then there's the focus on some of the content areas like science, social studies, and then the English and language arts curriculum focuses on writing essays and and the content and the message and just the overall organization of what you're reading and writing. And it's focused more on the literature and the vocabulary. And yes, kids are still learning to read, but that's not as much of the focus of the instruction because there is that shift. And for a lot of kids, they do pretty well with this sequence. And so that's why this is kind of the the starting point as far as how it typically works. That all being said, there are many talented, capable people who need something that's a little bit different. Or maybe they still follow this general flow, but they need some more intensive instruction in certain areas in order to be able to continue to make progress and benefit from the curriculum and and keep moving forward. There are a number of different ways that the schools handle this, but one of the ways is that for kids who aren't making adequate progress or who appear to need something a little bit different, they can do a couple different things. One thing is that for kids who 
you know, we're not really sure. Do they just need a little bit more instruction to be able to catch up and learn how to decode words more efficiently so that they can continue to build their comprehension skills? So some kids just need some kind of a short-term extra intervention to continue to make progress so that they can continue to benefit from their curriculum and from, from their classes. But some kids... We might try that for a short period of time, but then we realize, you know what, they do need something more intensive and long-term, and, and those are typically the kids who qualify for special education. Now, some kids might qualify for special education right away because we just know based on their medical history or what or their other history that they just, we know that they are going to need something more involved for the long haul. And so obviously the schools will put those supports in place right away if they think that, you know, based on their evaluation, that it is appropriate. And and there is a full lengthy evaluation process that schools use in order to make sure that kids are getting the services that they qualify for. Now, when we look at the different groups of kids, depending on how well they are responding to this particular flow and sequence, there are some kids who, you know, they they move through the curriculum and that works for them. They continue to make progress and they are fine with what is offered in the general education curriculum. And then there are the group of kids who need something more, whether it be short term or something more long term. Now, with reading comprehension, what often happens is that when kids are struggling, and this is a very common, probably one of the most common areas where if kids need some kind of extra help, reading is one of the most common because number one, when you're in those early years, the two big areas as far as academic skills that we're thinking about working on are those early numeracy skills and math skills and then reading because those are the things that really form the foundation to be able to perform in the other subjects later down the line. So reading comprehension when kids need some kind of extra help, that's kind of the big heavy hitter where we see an issue and where schools are likely to provide some kind of an intervention because it is such an important skill. And so the question becomes when we have a student who need some extra support with reading comprehension, how does that look and what is everybody supposed to be doing when it comes to supporting that child? And most importantly, whose job is it to support that particular child's reading comprehension skills? So obviously, I would make the argument that it's everybody's job to support reading comprehension. But depending on who you are, as far as your relationship with that child, your role could look a little bit different. And yes, and obviously this is going to vary based on the amount of support and resources someone has, the family structure, cultural factors, all of those things. But I wanted to give a general starting point to work from so that you as someone who's supporting a child can have an idea of where to start. I'll start off with the teacher, and obviously I'm not going to cover every single thing that teachers are covering when it comes to English and language arts in this episode, but I am going to talk just about reading comprehension. So when kids get to the point in their curriculum where reading comprehension is a primary focus, there is a lot of emphasis on comprehension strategies. So figuring out how to look at a page and read through it and make sense of that information. So there are a lot of different strategies that you can use. You know, teachers will show kids how to look at the headings and then look at the paragraph and then figure out what's the main idea of the paragraph or the section that I just read. And then teachers will also share things like how to self-question throughout the course of the time when you're reading. And then they will also have some type of comprehension assessment where kids will have to summarize or state the main idea. Or a lot of times they'll have to answer a question 
that's commonly referred to as inferencing questions. So there are questions that they might ask that will just be reporting information back to see if kids can remember the message that they just read. And then there are inferencing or problem solving questions or questions that require kids to take the information that they've read and draw a conclusion and infer something that wasn't directly stated. All of these things that are really important skills to have. So these are some of the things that kids are asked to do when they are working on reading comprehension because these are really important critical thinking skills. We have to be able to learn how to take information in and interpret the message, but then also to be able to draw conclusions and critically think about what we have just taken in. Now, with that being said, the challenge for kids who are having a hard time with reading comprehension is that if the information didn't go in, they're not going to be able to, number one, report back those details that they just read. They're also not going to be able to tell you the gist of what they just read because they might not even get the message of one sentence at a time. And then they're not going to be able to infer and take the information and draw a conclusion because the information didn't even go in and they didn't even process the basic message to be able to then take it and critically think about it. So they're kind of asking kids to go a couple steps ahead of where they are. Now, as I've said before, a lot of kids are able to respond pretty well to this. So it makes sense for a lot of students to be able to do this type of instruction. So it, it totally makes sense that teachers are doing these types of things because they are really important. But if you have a child who is having a hard time understanding the basic message, then a lot of times they don't have the foundational skills to be able to do those more advanced skills. So when you're asking them over and over to practice these skills, it's kind of like just, I use this analogy a lot, it's, it's like if you were giving someone a swimming lesson and you didn't tell them what to do with their arms and their legs or, or they haven't quite caught on to what they should do with their arms and their legs and how they should position their head in the water and they're just having to jump in the pool over and over again and figure it out and they don't have that foundational set of skills and if you're just saying jump in the pool, jump in the pool and swim, well, they don't have those skills to be able to do it. And if we're asking them to do it over and over again, we're just asking them to do a skill that they don't know how to do without giving them the foundation that they need to do it successfully. Again, really the only way to know if kids are ready for these types of skills is to give them the opportunity to do it. Now, a lot of kids can just implicitly learn certain skills. So there are many cases where kids will just kind of have to, again, jump off the deep end and figure it out. And a lot of kids can do that. So again, like I've said before, totally makes sense for a lot of kids to be doing these types of skills. The question is, what do you do when a kid is struggling and you're working on these skills over and over again and they're not making progress? Where is that sticking point? And what do we do differently for those kids? So here is where we bring in some of those other people that I was talking about. So the teacher is fulfilling their role, delivering the instruction. A lot of their kids are doing great, but then they might have a couple students who appear to need more than what the general education curriculum can offer. Now, I want to be clear. I am not saying that when that happens, that teachers are not doing their jobs. They absolutely are. That's why we have these other professionals available to work as a team with the general education teachers to add to those students' supports and curriculum and just overall educational plan. And, and that's the whole point of why those people are there. So for a special education teacher, if they were to come in, a lot of times they would be providing some more remedial instruction for some of those skills that might be preventing that student from comprehending what they read. 
if they are having a hard time comprehending because they're not able to read the words and they're spending so much time and energy trying to think about how to sound a word out, well, then that's going to take away from the amount of resources they're able to devote to paying attention to the overall message. And so that can cause an issue with comprehension. And again, it doesn't mean that the comprehension instruction is bad. It just means that that particular student might need some other skills to become stronger in order for them to be able to respond positively to those comprehension strategies that the teacher is showing them how to do. So it doesn't necessarily mean that they stop working on those critical thinking skills. It just means that they need something else in addition to. And yes, sometimes it does make sense to prioritize and figure out, okay, do we need to scale back on one thing to make room for the other and that kind of thing. Now, for speech pathologists, they come in as well for a lot of students. And this is the same for reading specialists as well. A lot of times they can provide some additional instruction that will help to build those foundational reading skills and also support students' vocabulary. Now, when it comes to speech pathologists, this is where some of those supports that can help students' language and processing come in. And speech pathologists often can have the background and experience that will enable them to support students' decoding skills. But depending on how the team works, if there is already another teacher who's working on spelling, for example, then the speech pathologist might work on some other things just because you want to make sure that you're covering all your bases and divvy up all the responsibilities. So it does get a little bit messy here. Sometimes there are multiple people that are qualified to do a certain thing and you just have to figure out how to divide up the responsibilities based on the amount of time someone has in their their schedule based on the way that the building is set up and then also just based on what makes the most sense based on the person's background so for speech pathologists because a lot of times kids who are struggling with reading comprehension if you don't have a solid understanding of vocabulary. So for example, if you don't know at least 90% of the words in the text that you're reading, your comprehension will suffer, even if you have some of those decoding skills. So if you don't know what the words mean, then when you get to the end of the paragraph, it's gonna be really hard for you to understand what's going on. And just understanding the gist and the overall concept of what's happening, when you don't have an understanding of that topic, you don't have that that knowledge of, of just the words and, and again, the topic knowledge, then sometimes it can be really confusing to understand what's going on. And so if you don't have a well-developed vocabulary, then that can make reading comprehension a challenge. And so speech pathologists can come in and really build students' vocabulary and then also give them the skills that they need in order to just think about language differently so that when they are reading, they can more efficiently learn new words. That's really what we want students to be able to do is have a lot of exposure to language because that's what's going to help them learn a lot of words and continue to learn those words. When kids aren't able to read as effectively and when they don't have as much exposure to the language of books, then it does mean that they are less likely to develop vocabulary at the same rate as another child who might have a lot of exposure to books and text language. So we want to figure out a way to continue to build those skills so that reading comprehension is possible because that does build vocabulary. So something else that speech pathologists can come in and do, and this is something that can be kind of counterintuitive. So it's not just about what words mean and understanding that topic knowledge. The other thing that is really important when it comes to language is understanding syntax and how sentences are put together. So it's definitely important to know how to decode words. That's why a lot of the interventions that can have an impact on reading comprehension are actually not focused directly on those comprehension strategies like saying the main idea, but are actually more focused on some of those skills that support being able to read and decode words. 
because that can have an impact on comprehension. Once you make kids more efficient at doing that, they can actually comprehend better. But in addition to that, kids need to be able to make sense of the way sentences are put together, so the grammar and the syntax, because if they don't have a good understanding of how to form a sentence, then that's really going to make their comprehension suffer, especially if they don't understand how to use things like conjunctions. So the the connecting words in a sentence, like the basic ones are and, but, or, and then some of the more the complex ones would be things like because, therefore. So words that connect clauses and make those longer sentences. Kids who have a hard time paying attention to those types of things and don't really understand how a sentence is put together, they have a hard time comprehending one sentence at a time. So of course, when you ask them to restate what they just read in an entire paragraph or ask them to answer a question about it, they don't remember what they just read and they didn't understand the message because they're just trying to figure out how to understand the message of one sentence at a time. And so building those skills, those syntactic skills, can be something that is really powerful for students because that gives them that foundation for that high-level comprehension so that they have more resources to critically think and problem solve and think about what's going on in whatever it is that they're reading and, and actually learn more words and content. So that is another area where speech pathologists can come in and really focus. And in the framework that I described in the presentation that I mentioned earlier and the framework that I teach to SLPs that I mentor in my signature course, that is one of the things that I really hone in on and teach them to focus on in their therapy because that can be something that isn't addressed as much with the reading specialist or the special ed teacher or even the general education teacher, not because they're not doing their jobs, just because everybody has so many things that they need to work on and we all need to be kind of like a big puzzle filling in all these pieces of what each student needs. So that is why working as a team and kind of understanding how all of these roles work can be really powerful because when you figure out what the student needs and can figure out, okay, who's doing what, then that's when you can really make a difference in a student's life and their ability to build these skills. So that is, again, with all of these things, it's not necessarily that there's only one person that can be doing this one skill. It's just that this is a way that it can work based on each person's role. There's obviously some flexibility in this, but I found that people sometimes want a starting point. This can be so overwhelming for teachers, for therapists, for parents to figure out what the heck am I supposed to do to support this child? And so that's why I give these recommendations as far as who's supposed to be doing what. Now, I wanted to wrap up. And again, if you are a parent and you're not an educational professional, I know that a lot of this is something that you might not be doing on a day-to-day basis if you're not directly in the classroom and you're figuring out, okay, what do I do when my child gets home from school? So I wanted to just wrap up really quickly and talk about that. And if you are a professional, it can also be beneficial for you to understand, all right, what should the parent do? Because teachers, therapists need to work with parents to let them know what they should do after their child leaves school or their therapy session with parents because I like to keep it as sustainable as possible. I would rather have parents do something super simple and do it consistently than try to do something that is overcomplicated and overwhelming and not sustainable. One of the most powerful things that parents can do is just give kids access and space to have print exposure, meaning time with books. Now, that is getting more and more challenging these days because of devices and social media. And I am okay with things like Kindles and, you know, screen readers and things like that. But it is really important to make sure that kids have time with text that's not distracted time. It's really hard if you're on a phone to just 
ignore all the different notifications going off. So I do recommend if you are going to do some kind of a device that it, it is something that's more of a dedicated reading device or that there is some kind of a way to block out all those notifications so you're not jumping around from one thing to another. Because again, if you allow yourself to be distracted and you don't give yourself time to just sit and focus on one thing, that trains your brain to need all of those different breaks. Yes, some people do legitimately need those breaks because of their attention span, but the only way to extend the amount that you're able to tolerate is to give yourself time in that space. Even if it does feel a little bit uncomfortable, then it does improve the amount of time you're able to attend. So I am a huge proponent of traditional actual books, not devices, but I know that a lot of times it is easier to have a bunch of books on a Kindle or something like that. So if you are going to do a device, I would recommend something like that. Um, now with books on tape, those are those are fine as well. But just be aware that it's not the same thing as reading. If you have a child who is listening to an audiobook, they are working on their listening comprehension skills. That is something that's really valuable. They can build their vocabulary that way. And something that they can also do is that if they are listening to a book that might be at a reading level that's too hard for them at the present time, then they can still experience that book. They can be exposed to the vocabulary in that book. And this is the same as if, if you're reading to your child, which again is something that I highly recommend. So with things like that, yes, definitely recommended. It does allow kids to have access to books that they wouldn't normally be able to access if they if it wasn't being read to them. So those are good but it's not the same thing as having that print exposure. So I don't recommend a total replacement with audiobooks, but they are a good thing to work in, especially if you have a child who is still working on the reading level, is, is not quite, um, let's say that maybe they have an interest in some books that they're not able to read yet, and you're having a hard time getting them interested in books, you can definitely start with some of those audiobooks as well because that allows them to be able to participate and, and learn that vocabulary without reading, but doesn't replace it. Still good to actually have kids look at print, especially in a way that is a time that is not distracted, that doesn't have a lot of you know, stuff and devices and, and those types of things, because you can increase your tolerance and train your brain to not need as much distraction doesn't mean that, for example, if you have someone who has ADHD, for example, it doesn't mean that your brain is going to be like a neurotypical brain, but you can increase your tolerance. So I strongly encourage that. And also it does make it a lot harder to say no to those distractions if you have someone who is, um, you know, who does have a shorter attention span. And of course, in addition to giving your children access to reading, it is still a great practice to read with your kids, to have them read to you, to have discussions about what you're reading, and also to do it in a way that is interactive as opposed to more passive. So as opposed to just giving them something that reads to them or allowing them to read on their own, just reading with them, discussing it, discussing the vocabulary, and talk about, talking about what happened, those are great things to do. It doesn't mean that those other things I mentioned are bad, it's just that they're not the same. So reading with your kids, and again, the, the recommendation is about 20 minutes a day, and if you can do that several times a week, as much as possible, that is a great practice. So that is where parents can fill in the role. If you want to do something that's kind of like you know, what's my minimum requirement that I'm doing? That is where your starting point is. Now, if you want to go above and beyond, then that is great as well. Um, but I do like to give people that starting point because it's more important to be consistent than to have this perfect process that you do with your kids. And if you do want something more specific, you can always talk to your child's 
teacher or speech pathologist or reading specialist. Talk to some of the professionals that are working with your child to get some recommendations of some things that you can do above and beyond just just reading and discussing and giving kids exposure. But the exposure alone can make a big difference. So if that's all you're doing, you are already ahead of most people. going to wrap up for today. But again, remember, if you want more information about the framework that I teach to build some of those foundational language skills that can support reading comprehension and language processing, then definitely check out my free online presentation called the Five Component Language Therapy Framework. All you need to do to sign up is go to drkarenspeech.com backslash language. So again, if you are a speech language pathologist and you're not exactly sure where to start when it comes to language therapy, especially when it comes to supporting students literacy skills and comprehension skills, and you're not quite sure what your role is in this whole process, then I definitely recommend checking it out. It will give you a ton of clarity. This is the framework that I put together during my doctoral work, and the inspiration for it was because when I first started practicing, I felt pretty lost when it came to language and was really overwhelmed, and as a result, when I first started practicing, I didn't really feel like I got good results with my students. Obviously, I was able to turn that around when I created this framework. So if you are a speech pathologist, it will be directly relevant to what you do day to day if you are supporting a K-12 caseload. Now, if you're a teacher or a parent, you're definitely welcome to check it out as well. I have actually had some teachers and parents check out some of my resources and share it with the, their students or their child's speech pathologist. And then also I know that sometimes teachers or parents just want to know more information about how to support kids. So you're welcome to check it out as well or share it with your speech pathologist. Again, to sign up for that free online presentation, all you need to do is go to drkarenspeech.com backslash language. Again, that's drkarenspeech.com backslash language language. Again, before I wrap up, I wanted to remind you that it helps me out so much to get this information to the people who need it if you share it with your friends and colleagues. And also leave me a five-star review on Apple or Spotify or wherever you listen to your podcasts. Again, thank you so much for listening and I will see you in episode 44.